everyone. Welcome to Playhouse Academy's second Playhouse Day. Let me introduce myself first. My name is Dara Jessica Mamitada, and I am an early years educator by profession. Today, I'll be talking about the six stages of play, which is a theory regarding children's participation in play that was developed by researcher Mildred Parton. Now, this theory has been around for a long time, but I still find it to be a relevant resource to help me observe children as a part of my work. Now today we're talking about these six stages of play because it's important for us as adults to understand what children's play can look like and more importantly, what they mean. How can we provide the most optimal environment to encourage these plays to happen if we don't even know what these plays do for kids? Because for kids, play is work. It's their job to play and explore and play is an important part of a child's healthy development. During play, kids can master all sorts of skills and tackle new challenges that will help them to uh, tackle any future endeavors as they grow up. Skills such as problem solving skills, communication, social skills, conflict resolution, cooperation, and of course in play, they develop self-awareness, self-confidence that will help them become an active part of our society. Now, let's get right to it. Um, so, like I said, the six stages of play is a theory that was developed by Mildred Parton, and it was born from observing children of different ages and how they behave and interact during free play. This theory will break down how children's play look, uh, following their growth, and of course, what they mean. And these are the six stages, from one all the way to six. And this is just a simple image to help us visualize what each stage of play may look like. Um, of course, play is not set in stone, so it can look different every single time. Starting right off with unoccupied play, the first play, um, this is most commonly seen happening with children ages zero to three months. Um, children this young are most likely to engage in this kind of play, although their play doesn't really look much like play um, but this is the first step and um, how does it look like so it looks like it still lacks any kind of social interaction it looks very scattered and doesn't have a purpose physically it looks like the baby is just doing random movements uh, like they're doing a lot of reaching and kicking and giggling and wiggling around and of course they lack any kind of sustained focus because they're so young so they're just going to go for whatever grabs their attention at the moment now, what does this mean though? It may not look like much what they are doing, but there's a lot of things that's happening here. So during unoccupied play, children are using all of their senses to explore materials around them without any structure because they are so young. Everything they see, touch, hear, smell, taste, everything is completely new to them. Um, and these young children are observing and taking in a lot of new information about how their world, how their body works, practicing how to control it, and how to manipulate materials around them. In these first few months of life, unoccupied play will help them orient them within their surroundings. Um, in addition to that, they're also learning how to master gross motor skills, they develop perception, object permanence, and tactile skills. <clears throat> as we enter stage two, solitary play. Now this stage of play is most commonly seen happening with kids uh, age three months to all the way to two and a half year olds. And at this point, their play starts to look a lot more like real play. Um, what I mean by that is they're starting to utilize the toys and how they are designed. Um, and just like the name here, the children play alone. They play alone and mind only the toys that are in front of them. Children at this stage make minimal to no attempts to interact or play with other kids. So what does it look like? Solitary play can, just like the first stage, they still lack in social interaction. There's still a disinterest in other humans. And, but there is an increase in sustained focus and attention, but only to the toys that's in front of them. Uh, they're, they're also starting to do symbolic play. And, but despite all of that, uh, their play still looks very unstructured and lacks a clear goal. <clears throat> now, what I mean by goal is 
Unlike more mature and structured play, in solitary play, their play doesn't have a finish line that they want to reach. Um, we can look at it how um, other kids and even adults play. So for example, during a card game in Indonesia, we call, uh, we have chapsa, yeah, where each player compete to uh, throw in the biggest combination of cards. And the goal is simple, it's to finish all your cards first. That's how you win, that's the finish line. So there is a specific goal that all the players are aiming to achieve. But in solitary play with children this young, there's no such thing. There's no structure. There's no um, goal that they are all that they are aiming towards. Yeah, they're playing until something else grabs their attention. So what's actually happening here at this stage is that children are exploring more freely because now they have more control over their body. In the previous stage, maybe they can only lie down, but now they're learning how to sit up and maybe crawl on all fours. So they have more access to be more free and, and, and explore more things because they have more control over their body. They're learning and mastering new personal skills and they're gaining confidence in doing independent work. Independent work, we can think of it as them as preparing them to go to big school. So when we think into the future during primary school, kids will uh, do a lot more independent seat work on their own tables. So children who have learned to be comfortable doing solitary play will feel um, more comfortable embracing working independently. What can adults do during this? Well, we can, number one, let the solitary play unfold. Don't immediately assume that your child is feeling lonely just because they're playing alone. First, we must observe and we resist to just swoop in to entertain the child. Let them be constructively bored. Now, the key word here is constructive boredom, which is a, a, a a term that is coined by two researchers, Karen Gasper and Rihanna Middlewood. And they suggest that being bored actually benefits human because it encourages you to seek out and engage in more satisfying activities. They stimulate your creativity. So constructively bored kids actually find alternatives to entertain themselves, um, to be creative and leading them to new discoveries. The next stage, we have what's called onlooker play. And this can be seen happening with kids aged two and a half to three and a half years old. Now, during this time, adults may notice that um, a child could be stopping and just looking at other children play in the playground. Um, and adults may see these onlookers and take it as a clue that maybe they want to participate. But even after adult encouragement, turns out that they don't actually want to join. Yeah. So it looks like they're showing interest, but they don't actually want to join just yet. Now, at this stage, um, maybe questions such as, does he not know how to make friends? Is she feeling lonely? Those types of questions will start to pop up in the adult's mind. But don't worry, because we can think of this stage as the kid's version of people watching. Yeah. So um, have you ever found yourself uh, sitting in a cafe, you know, just sipping your own coffee and observing and maybe even listening to other what other people are doing? So maybe you could be thinking, oh, what are what did they order in that table over there? There's a lot of food, but they seem to be enjoying it a lot. Did I order anything that they ordered? So those are very simple, but observant and reflective thoughts that might cross our mind as an adult when we do people watching. Um, and something very similar can happen to children as they enter the onlooker play stage. Um, <clears throat> so uh, there's various reasons as to why a child may be withholding participation. They could still feel maybe uncertain. Maybe they haven't built up the confidence yet, so they're not ready to be social. And maybe they're just, you know, feeling a little bit scared, which is understandable um, if they want to just be a spectator at the moment. And we have to remember that listening and observing is a powerful learning tool. Next, we enter stage four, which is parallel play. And this can uh, be seen happening with kids aged three to four years old. Now, parallel play is follows the onlooker stage because now children are playing physically alongside each other, but they're not playing together. They're in close proximity, but they're not together. Um, what they're doing is that they're playing beside each other, 
but they're not with each other. So they may share resources, share toys, and maybe they observe one another from a distance, but they're not playing the same game. They don't have the same rules or goals yet. And what you can spot during parallel play is um, children are starting to play in the same space. They are being close to each other, but again, not together. They're starting to share resources, but they still have, they still have separate goals um, and focuses during play. There's still a lack of acknowledgement of other children, hence the minimal communication that's happening and any kind of exploration and discovery that happens here is independent. So um, for example, like this picture right here, we see two children sitting in the same table, sharing the same uh, paint set and uh, sharing brushes. You know, They're both in the same space right next to each other and they're both painting. But when you look closely, they're painting two totally different things. They're not even using the same canvas. So what they're doing is they're doing two separate things, just being close to one another. Um, so instead of working on one artwork together, they're doing it each one separately. Um, so just like the name, the play happens parallel to one another, but they're not meeting each other. Yeah, they're, they're using the same things, but nothing else overlaps. Um, one child is doing A, one child is doing B, and their exploration is independent. Uh, but they are learning to share the space, share the same resources, and they're learning how to be amongst peers. But aside from that, nothing else about the play overlaps. Next, we enter stage five, which is called associative play. And this can start to happen with children ages four to four and a half years old. At this stage, children start acknowledging each other during play and they begin to play with other people. Um, whilst they are playing and working alongside by side um, with each other, they may still be following their own storyline in play. Now, all right. How is that different then to parallel play? Well, to start off, they're starting to acknowledge each other. So, um, they're starting to acknowledge other children and start doing things together. So instead of being more focused on the activity that's in front of them and the toys that they're playing, they're starting to be more interested in um, the other players, the other kids around them. So they begin to copy and follow other kids during the play. And what it can look like is they start to play in small groups. Um, they start to negotiate uh, share uh, while they share resources. So language skills start to emerge and they start to ask each other questions, but they still have different objectives and strategies during play. So for example, um, there are three kids who are all almost four years old and they're using the same playground. They start laughing and running and chasing around each other, but they don't seem to have agreed who is the chaser and who is being chased. And they've also never discussed on the goal of this game, whether they are now sharks chasing their prey or they're knights chasing away the evil dragon. Yeah, so, but I mean, they're all having fun and are, but they're just following this different goals and different rules. Now, what is actually happening here is that they are practicing the skills that they learned during the previous stages. And they're also practicing some newfound social skills. There's a blooming interest in other humans during play, and that's why they're beginning to realize that they are a part of a community, which is so beautiful. Lastly, we enter stage six cooperative play, which can be seen happening with kids aged four and a half years and up, which is now is the highest and most sophisticated form of play. Yeah. Um, so uh, what we can see here is that at this stage, children are playing in smaller groups as they did in the previous stage. Um, but now children are beginning to demonstrate a division of labor and roles. Um, they're establishing rules of play and they're cooperating to attain a common goal, which requires a lot of communication amongst two or more people to keep the play going. Um, they're also engaging in a lot of role play where players contribute to building the scenario. Uh, they're also starting to be interested in board games and card games and video games, which is games and plays that have a clear goal and rule. And of course, uh, during cooperative play, we can expect to see a lot of conflict. 
Um, so what are they actually learning at this stage is that they're learning social skills. They are learning how to compromise, how to do conflict resolution, how to effectively communicate with each other. They're also learning a sense of belonging and a community. Uh, they're learning that they're not alone and there are other people that I want to be with and I want to have fun with. Um, they're also learning some problem solving and negotiating skills and also learning the rules and strategies of play. They're beginning to regulate their emotions and also finding healthy ways to express those big feelings. Um, now, of course, uh, these are all very advanced skills uh, and it can be very difficult for young children to learn these. Um, it's, yeah, it's difficult, it's hard for young children to share, to negotiate control in cooperative play, but they need to learn this. They need to learn how to exist in the same space with other people who might think and want differently from you. So what can we do as adults to help? We can, number one, encourage the play settings where they can actually be social. Yeah, And we can teach healthy and safe ways to express those big emotions so that they don't end up hurting themselves or other friends. Um, we can give them chances. Uh, to actually face the conflict and resolve it themselves, giving them firsthand experience. And it is best to interfere in conflict resolution only when things are getting heated up and becoming unsafe. So um, from what we can see from today's discussion is that play is work because they're learning so much through play. If we follow the, the progression of the six stages of play, we can see progressively that in each stage, children are tackling new challenges and mastering new skills, growing in self-awareness and confidence and all those important things. And as children become older and opportunities for peer interactions become more common, the earlier non-social types of play, solitary and parallel, become less common when the social types of play, the associative and cooperative play, become more common. And hopefully, as, get it, as we get some insight on how children's play look like and what they mean, we as adults can follow their development better and we can provide our children opportunities for growth as much as possible. So um, that's it from me today. Uh, Please do excuse me if there were any errors of speech along the way, but thank you so much for tuning in and have a great rest of your day. Bye.